Let's give a warm steamboat welcome to Dr. Brian Dimitrovic.
you think of Frank Capra's movies, for example, It Happened One Night, Nobody Has Any Money. You think, of course, of Les, of Les Malcrae's famous man, James Agee, and of John Steinbeck's novel, uh, which was written in the very late 30s, he, uh, The Grapes of Wrath, which is, of course, about starvation and how people come together uh, to these very difficult circumstances and try to find ways to help each other. One of the things I've been amazed at since the Great Recession uh, troughed and then didn't really depart uh, in 2009 is that we haven't had any kind of full color spreads on the internet or everywhere about the panorama of poverty in the United States. And uh, I know uh, there are at least 15 million people or more um, who qualify as that. And that's a big new national scourge. And I'm wondering why we haven't seen anything like that. My assumption is because, because we have a left wing Democrat in office and in the presidency, and it would be unbecoming to the incumbents to demonstrate that. Um, so I think actually that we've had a very significant cultural failure on the part of our cultural institutions since 2009. I'm saying all this for a reason, because I'm recapitulating uh, some history that actually took place in the 1950s and early 1960s. Uh, John F. Kennedy, uh, as you may know, uh, cut taxes. Uh, he cut taxes by about 30% apiece. Uh, all the big rates and in the income tax, and we have a progressive income tax code, not one rate, but the more you make, the more you pay. Uh, back then, there were 24 rates of the income tax code. The top one was 91%. Okay, so not misspeaking here. I didn't say 9%. No, I said 100 minus 9. 91% was the top rate of the income tax, and the bottom rate was 20%. And he cut, he proposed a tax cut that cut the top rates by 26 points down to 65%. He compromised to get it to 70, and the bottom rate by 6 points by 30%. Uh, to 14%, and all the rates in between had commensurately a 30% tax cut. And you say, oh, well, that sounds familiar, really, because that's what Ronald Reagan proposed in 1981. Of course, it was exactly on JFK's model. As Jack Kemp said to his staff at Bruce Bartlett in February 1977, um, what are we fooling around for here for, you know, proposing all these little tax cuts? Why don't we just do a straight duplication of the Kennedy tax cut? And that was actually the germ of the kemp Rock bill that became the Ronald Reagan tax cut in 1981. And that's what our book is about. Our book is about the story of how the phenomenal Kennedy tax cut came to be, and then how it inspired the Reagan tax cut of 1981. And in both instances, there was a remarkable resurgence out of torpor in the American economy. And if we were beset by torpor in the American economy, especially in the entrenched one, again, now, wouldn't it be a perfect time to explore this history and perhaps learn from it, and maybe want to emulate it a bit? I have to ask you, can everybody hear me if I'm talking this microphone all right? Yeah. Okay. So um, I'm going to publish a, a column in Forbes probably this week uh, with the title, uh, Hillary, the new Nixon. Okay, no surprises there, right? Uh, Bernie, the new JFK. Uh, what? Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, and this is the particular reason that, I, I, by the way, I have to disclose something. I have started the local action committee in favor of Ted Cruz's monetary views, so I should just tell you that. And we've been running radio ads all over the place. Um, and I'm uh, the advisor to Ted Cruz, not to the presidential campaign, but to his, uh, his policy team. Anyway, um, the uh, new Nixon, you think, oh, the water hate, and so forth. No, 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 I'm referring to the change in her political campaign. Because as you may recall, when Hillary Clinton ran in 2008, she did run for president in 2008, uh, very strenuously. And uh, does anybody recall what her campaign message was? It was peace and prosperity. She will bring back the peace and prosperity of the 1990s. That was the basis of her campaign. It was the message of the campaign. So she was campaigning on significant economic growth including at the top. I mean, there's no doubt that all the techies and so forth and Wall Street did very well in the 1990s, but across the board, significant economic growth in the context of peace. That was her campaign. If you want to bring back the 1990s, go for me. And uh, now, we don't have any hint of that in her campaign. She never talks about economic growth. She never talks about peace and prosperity. She never talks about the 1990s. I understand that her 2008 campaign was unsuccessful, but still, we don't hear this. We hear raising taxes on the rich, so on the high income earners, so that there can uh, be some kind of redress of the inequality problem. We hear of the Buffett rule and so forth. Um, no semblance of any kind of talk of economic growth. 
And Richard Nixon, when he was running for president in 1960, he thought I was going to talk about Watergate. Nothing hurt to Richard Nixon, no. Um, in the 18 and a half minute gap and so forth. That's not what I'm, I'm drawing a favorable comparison to uh, with uh, Hillary and uh, Richard Nixon. When Richard Nixon was running for president, when he was vice president of the United States in 1960, so in Eisenhower's last year, um, he was running during a recession year. Uh, there was the third recession in eight years, in seven years, in six years actually, in 1960. There had been a recession in 1953-54, a recession in 1957-58 that at its trough was worse in terms of the loss of economic output, actually, than the trough of the 2008-2009 Great Recessions. We always repeat this line, it's the worst recession since the Great Depression, because the, the two quarterly drop in GDP in 1957-58 was actually a couple of points, uh, tens of points worse than 2008-2009. Uh, the auto industry lost 25% of its jobs. Detroit uh, had 30% unemployment. You say, oh yeah, I know that's 2009, right, that's 1958. Uh, and then there was a recession again in 1960. And Richard Nixon was like, uh, what? This is great. It's been great economic growth. Everything's great. Now there's wonderful economic growth. And throughout the campaign, he used to say that anyone who says there's not even enough economic growth, that's that old growthmanship from the Keynesians who said we need growth, government spending. This is the greatest growth we've ever seen. He had to deny that there's any kind of growth problem because he felt responsibility for the lack of growth. And this, I think, is the transformation that's not overtaken the whole thing. During 2008, she could decry the lack of growth. And let's face it, under George W. Bush, the, I mean, the growth, cumulative growth was only about 2% per year under the George W. Bush presidency, well below half what the 1980s, 1990s average was. And so she was able to, to, you know, to point to the incumbent and say, well, I'm going to bring growth. But since the new incumbent, and under whom she served as Secretary of State, produced economic growth a little bit even worse than, than George W. Bush's, um, she's like, well, this is the best of all possible worlds. Uh, and so she's dropped the growth thing. And believe it or not, that has left the growth issue on the floor to be picked up as if a, as if a feather. As Lenin said when he went to pick up power in the Russian Revolution in March 1917. I mean, it's, economic growth is on the floor for anyone to pick it up. Bernie Sanders picked it up. Unbelievably. And he said, yeah, we're going to have 5% economic growth under my plan. Now that, of course, is madness. I mean, he's talking about increasing taxes by $16 trillion and so forth, and saying that's going to be the elixir for growth, and that's going to produce, that's not, not going to happen, right? I mean, you cannot produce anything but, as Arthur Laffer says, you know, 5 or 6% contraction or more uh, from those kind of policies. But the point is taken that the economic growth issue was left on the ground to be picked up as a feather, and he picked it up. And of course, all the economists have waited, so, oh, well, that's technically impossible. Right. He's talking about economic growth, and he's crystallized one of the major, I would argue, the major issue in the campaign that's kind of causing such consternation among the electorate. It's like, where's the growth? This country has been growing for 235 years. In the 19th century, the rate of growth in the United States was about 4.5% per year. Since 1913, which was the inflection point, and the creation of the Federal Reserve and the income tax that year, we've only had about 3.2% growth. But in the nice runs, like the 60s, when John F. Kennedy took office, the growth rate for the next eight and three quarters years was 5.1% per year. Before then, under Eisenhower, was 2.4%, so more than double. In the 1980s, it was 4.5 for seven years. In the 1990s, it was 4.5 for seven years. So we're well under half that, about 40% the uh, traditional average during booms. And no one was talking about it. So Bernie picked it up off the ground. And so that's actually how he's the new, new Nixon. It's remarkable how much that recapitulates the 1960 campaign with Nixon and Kennedy. Nixon denied that there was any kind of growth problem. And actually, he almost got a, <coughs> a convention challenge on that issue. It was from Nelson Rockefeller, governor of New York. The Rockefeller brothers. Lawrence and, uh, and uh, Winthrop and uh, Nelson and the others, David, who's still out of the way, Rob Keller today. Uh, he's actually, we, Larry and I were trying to figure out if any, any of the John Kennedy participants were still alive for us to interview. Uh, we did determine that David Rockefeller was still alive, uh, although at the age of 100. And he, when we we've, uh, looked into getting in touch with him, we found out he had just had a sixth heart transplant. So we decided we would, uh, we would let him. <laughs>
we would like it to be. Um, Dave Rockefeller having been the chairman of Chase Manhattan Bank uh, back then. Uh, but uh, David and Nelson and Lawrence and Winthrop Rockefeller had published a very uh, notable, much discussed report in the teeth of the 1957-58 recession saying, we really have to double our national growth rate. Our growth rate's about 2.5%. It's got to be five. And if we double our growth rate to 5%, and they introduced that figure of 5% growth rate, actually had been discussed in Congress a little bit before the Joint Economic Committee. Um, if we have 5% growth, we're going to be able to eliminate our poverty. We're going to be able to eliminate our debt. We're going to be able to solve all our entitlements problems. And we're going to have a surplus, which you know, people can keep, but we do whatever we want. We solve our problems, essentially. It was this famous Rockefeller report, as the press called it. And so when Nixon said, stalled on saying there was even a growth problem at all, Rockefeller uh, challenged him. And then Nixon had a very famous um, rapprochement, a meeting of the minds with Nelson Rockefeller. He went to Nelson Rockefeller's apartment on Fifth Avenue in New York and decided he would concede that the nation had to have 5% economic growth. And they issued a joint statement together saying, okay, the nation has to have 5% economic growth. And the press mocked this as the compact of Fifth Avenue. You know, the, 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 but Nixon did say that in, in July of 1960. He kind of dropped it again in the debates with Kennedy. But he made this big, and, that, and that made, that's the reason Nelson Rockefeller did not challenge it, that he conceded we need, we, it's totally realistic for us to have 5% economic growth, and we should double our growth rate to get it. And then the Democrats, in their platform that year, in July of 1960, their convention in Los Angeles, um, they included in their party platform that we should double our growth rate to 5%. And they had a little dig at Eisenhower, you know, and this 5% growth rate would be double the rate that the incumbent has been presiding over since 1953. So it's funny, when we hear today, oh, growth is impossible, we're in secular stagnation, this is the new normal, we have to get used to diminished expectations, we hear that from a lot of people, including credential economists. We only thought back to 60 years ago to find that there was actually bipartisan consensus that when we're confronted with slow growth, we have to realize that America is capable of these historically very high rates. And the funny thing is, John F. Kennedy came into office. This was the standard, you better grow 5%. By the way, total success. So February 1961, when the recession ended, until the next recession came, not until December 1969, which was when Nixon would be president, eight three quarter, Years, 5.1% growth. Now that's the secret of post-war prosperity. Everyone always says, oh, post-war prosperity, yes. Yeah, the most vaunted era of American economic history. That's when everybody had a good job. The next generation was gonna do great. We could afford a couple cars, a house, a vacation home, all these wonderful gadgets. Yeah, I remember that. That was the 1950s. The 1950s under Eisenhower, 2.4% growth. Serial recessions. Increasing poverty to the extent. And here's the point I wanna make about culture. Uh, that the most famous book I've written about poverty in the United States came out of the 1950s and early 1960s sluggishness. And this is uh, a book called The Other America by Michael Harrington. I don't know if you've ever heard of this book. It's actually um, the, the, the best-selling nonfiction book uh, on public affairs of the second half of the 20th century. Um, it's the first book that Penguin decided to publish nonfiction in paper in the United States. And that, that, that book sold, uh, sold one million copies beginning in 1963. Michael Harrington was a, a social worker, left wing, total left wing guy, uh, socialist, called himself Democrat Socialist, and he was assigned by Commentary Magazine in uh, 1958 to start to looking into the, into the human effects of these serial recessions that kept happening. And here's what he said, it's, uh, it's amazing how resonant this, uh, this is to today. He said, uh, we're building up a class of structurally unemployed and permanently poor. And by the time he finally published these articles as a book in 1962, he numbered these people at 50 million, 5 So it was a population of 180 million, 190. And the, the structurally poor was about a third, or a little bit less, about uh, 50 million. He said, here's the reason, the main reason. He said, that, that at least half of the reason is this. <coughs> Lack of economic growth is half the reason. And the reason we haven't had economic growth is high progressive taxation. And he had a very, this is Democratic Socialist saying this. And there's very good, uh, uh, he had very clear logic saying what, how exactly high progressive taxation is creating a, a permanent growing class of 50 million poverty. 
So what's going on with zero recession, these high progressive taxes, is every single time the economy starts getting somewhere, people are thrown into higher tax brackets. This is before the tax cut was indexed for inflation. So if you start making a little money, you start out to pay you know, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 percent of your income in taxes. And so you just put the skids on that real fast as you start to make a little money and just said, I'm going to be content. So every, every time there was a recovery, the recovery stopped. And then the government would get large, the private sector would shrink because of the tax cut, progressive tax cut, and then there'd be a recession again. And as the recession happened, people's tax rates would go down because they were making less and less money, and they started to get into that, so they just kind of felt the recession for a little bit. Then it got a little too low, and then they started making a little more money, but then their tax rates went up. And this was a serial cycle. So every, it came to be, by 1960, the frequency of recession was every 24 months there was a recession. And what Michael Harrington said, the thing about this is what's going to happen is the people at kind of the bottom of the workforce um, are going to get laid off first in the recession. So as soon as the recession is, they'll be laid off. They will be laid off the entire recession cycle because there's no hiring. But then they won't get around to being hired again because they're the last hired. The first fired, the last hired. And if you go through, say, a cycle of that, you become permanently unemployed. You become so used to not working, you lose your skills, you, you become dispirited, and so you just join the class of the structurally unemployed poor. So serial recession, which is caused by high progressive taxation, including those very nosebleed rates on the rich, the specific harm of that tax code was its effect on creating a massive class of the poor. That was the diagnosis of the democratic socialists. In fact, the most famous democratic socialist in modern American history outside of maybe, I don't know, Dwight McDonald, Norman Thomas. I wouldn't say either of those guys actually had the influence for the significance that Michael Harrington did. And Michael Harrington said when he published his book, which then became a massive bestseller in 1962, The Other American, uh, Poverty in the United States being the subtitle, uh, he said you can solve at least half the problem, like you can cut it down by half and stem the, cre the creation of Newport by economic growth. No welfare program, no nothing. All you have to do, and he strongly implied cutting the tax rates would be the way to do it. This is the Democratic Socialist. That's what I'm saying. I mean, Bernie Sanders, it's funny, he's only kind of a half step away from, you know, if he could somehow find in a secret heart to say, what we need is a big tax rate cut at the top. Uh, he would actually be in consonance with the democratic socialist traditions of the United States. And I'll have a word to say about how that actually did play out in a very fascinating fashion in the 1980s with the last person before Bernie Sanders, who was a major political figure in the United States, to call himself, or to, to be uh, appreciated being called a democratic socialist. And that was Bill Bradley. Bill Bradley, the senator from New Jersey, was the one who cut the marginal tax rate from 50 to 28 percent on exactly those grounds in 1986. Right, inside the bill. But we'll get to that in a second. So, uh, Michael Harrington did say, okay, for the other half or so, 40%, you're going to need a welfare program. But for at least the first half, you don't. And I don't know why that message does not exist in American politics today. Uh, because it is a major part of the left-wing intellectual apparatus. The left, I tell you. That if you have a high progressive tax code, especially on the rich, there will not be capital formation. Recessions or sluggishness will become so persistent that there will become a class of permanently and structurally unemployed who are verging into and then entering poverty. That was the consensus among the top socialist intellectuals in this country 55, 60 years ago. Somehow the Democratic Party has forgotten. And they don't know their history whatsoever. So this is one of the reasons we want to write this book. Larry's always told, he knows you know, the Kennedy clan people hang out at these New York soirees. Larry's always uh, you know, uh, very happy to go to. Uh, and they, uh, he's been talking about Ken Kenny Tax Cut for years. I don't know if it's Carolina or who. Certainly it was Ted for a while. <coughs> who would send him cease and desist letters whenever he would say on television, oh, well, let's have another Kennedy tax cut. And they would say, John F. Kennedy's tax cut would be nothing like what you Republicans are talking about today. His tax cut was for the little guy. Yeah, it was for the little guy in terms of he wanted to cut the tax rates on the highest earners, those making over $400,000 a year, <coughs> so that they would get out of tax shelters into capital formation investments that would provide jobs for the little guy. Now, we actually know that as an absolute empirical matter of fact from turning upside down the Kennedy Library archives on this question. I mean, there can be no question 
about why John F. Kennedy wanted to cut taxes, it's because <coughs> he thought, in particular, the top rates on the rich were responsible for creating structurally unemployed in the United States. The top rates on the highest earners. <coughs> we have an abundance of memos of the Treasury Secretary Douglas Dillon. Dillon this kind of weird myth of the Keynesian advisors of the presidency. Uh, Kennedy's presidency told him to cut taxes, and he uh, rejected their advice. That's, we're going to prove that in this book, Beyond Shadow of Death. And he took the advice of his market representatives, mainly uh, his Treasury Secretary, C. Douglas Dillon, who's worth $200 million. And he told him, you have to cut taxes on the rich because that's where the jobs are created. And Kennedy uh, agreed with that. Yeah, these are residual allergies that I picked up in Texas over the weekend. Uh, so I need this mountain air uh, to clear them all out. Uh, so, um, a few details about the John F. Kennedy tax cut and how we might uh, be inspired by it today. I was just showing, um, I was just showing Jennifer a photograph, which I can't, I'm not going to show it as a visual, uh, of, uh, of the Yale College uh, graduation in 1963. It's a picture of Arthur Laffer. He was graduated from college. And uh, if you know Arthur Laffer, is the economist who was Ronald Reagan's closest economic advisor. And he was the author of the most recognized economics curve of the 20th century, the Laffer curve, uh, which shows an inverse relationship between tax rates and tax receipts. Um, and I'm a good friend of Arthur Laffer's. I spent a lot of time with him. I'm his historian. Uh, I'm a supply cyber historian. We published a lot of work together. We published a book last year called The Pillars of Reaganomics which is kind of a collection of his work. We'll be publishing a multi-volume um, document collection of uh, the supply-side tradition next year. I was at his place last week. Uh, I was on Super Tuesday, in fact, and uh, he was showing me some old pictures. And there he is, uh, graduating from Yale in 1963, this old, you know, ready-faced kid. And I know that uh, the year before, as a junior, he had attended the Yale commencement speech that John F. Kennedy had given. And that was the speech when he decided to change his policy from Keynesian to non-Keynesian. He made that announcement at the Yale commencement. He said, I'm going to have, I'm going to strengthen the dollar and I'm going to cut taxes. He actually didn't resolve to do it that day, but he said, you know, we've been following this policy of kind of loose money and high taxes. That was his advisors, Walter Heller, Paul Samuelson, Robert Solo, these Keynesian advisors, uh, on his Council of Economic Advisors, have been telling him to do this. You should have loose money and high taxes. And there were a bunch of reports that came in from Europe saying you should switch your, switch your mix to the opposite. One of them was actually written by this young kid who worked at the International Monetary Fund named Robert Mundell. And uh, Robert Mundell would then go on, by the way, to become Arthur Laffer's mentor at the University of Chicago. But, uh, and then at the, at the Yale speech, and we know that Kenny read this stuff because we have all his underlying copies in his archive. Uh, he said, we should switch. I'm thinking about switching. We should switch to sound dollar. So not lose money, let's have a sound dollar, and let's have uh, the fiscal stimulus to a tax cut, and a marginal tax cut. He said we should have a 30% reduction in the rates of the income tax. Um, and that was the speech he gave it. And Arthur Laffer was in attendance as a 22-year-old kid, junior. Actually, he spent his junior year abroad in Germany. And that was the first time he ever heard it, too. Uh, and that was another germ of the Reagan Revolution, because that's what Reagan did. You know, after the tremendous inflation of the 1970s, 160% increase in the price level in one decade, let's stabilize the dollar and cut tax rates. That's what Kennedy decided to do on the advice of the Bank of International Settlements, Douglas Dillon, and the International Monetary Fund. The International Monetary Fund memo written by Robert Mundell, who would become Arthur Laffer's mentor at the University of Chicago. Arthur Laffer was in attendance at that commencement address, and uh, John F. Kennedy did it. He uh, introduced the legislation. He announced he would do it right there that summer. Um, and uh, the Federal Reserve then started raising interest rates as he proceeded to cut taxes. Same thing as the 1980s. And the tax cut was finally was introduced to Congress, but there's all sorts of weird horse trading, which we'll come into in the book. Some weird stuff about why that tax cut didn't get passed in 1963. And it wasn't passed until uh, right after the assassination that Johnson just signed it as a memorial to Kennedy. Just one uh, quick side note on why, why Kennedy's tax cut was passed. It's very weird stories. Uh, the unions, the, the, the people who liked the uh, high tax rates of the uh, 50s and the private and the non-government, non uh, is a weird coalition, big coalition of those who favored the high nosebleed tax rates of the 
50s, up to 91%. And you know, Bernie Sanders is on the campaign trail, always talking about how great the 91% tax rate is. I would ask him, you know, call your office. I mean, find out what the democratic socialist tradition in the United States in the 50s and 60s said about the 91% tax rate. What did Michael Harrington say about that? I mean, there's no greater gone in the history of the left, intellectual left in the United States, than Michael Harrington. So I don't know what he's talking about. So we're going to have to, there's one reason we published this book while the campaign's still going on. Uh, we just want to correct some things. Um, so uh, the uh, coalition that was in favor of these high tax rates, number one was the Fortune 500. They liked it, the unions liked it, and the segregationists liked it. So what's going on with that? And they all kind of conspired to block that tax cut. The Fortune 500 liked it because it conferred a degree of stability to the corporate hierarchy of the United States. They realized that it's very difficult, number one, for venture capital to accumulate if there are very high tax rates. So what the corporations had were they had these very high tax rates with tons of exemptions to them. And each one of those exemptions, so the tax code at that point was about 12,000 pages long. The first two pages, the Internal Revenue Code of the United States, which was reformed in 1954 so that it could be, it could be receptive of more exemptions. The first two pages were the rates, 20% to 91%. The next 12,000 pages were the exemptions. And every one of them was uh, written for a particular individual. I mean, sometimes very particularly. So for example, in 1951, the, uh, Ronald Reagan's nemesis in the movie business, Louis B. Mayer, against whom Reagan always uh, had uh, adversarial negotiations with when Reagan was president of the Screen Actors Guild. Um, Louis B. Mayer retired in 1951. And he got written into the law a statute that applied only to him that said that his one-time one, one gain of $2.7 million, which was his retirement balloon payment, um, would not be taxable at the 91% rate, but at the 25% rate. Uh, so, yeah, and, but it was written in such a way that no one else could take advantage of it except him. And uh, there were 12,000 pages of this stuff. The Fortune 500 liked it because they realized it was very difficult for the venture capital industry to move. It was very difficult for capital accumulation in private sources outside of the confines of the Fortune 500 to accumulate and build up startups that could then upend the Fortune 500. And the Fortune 500 began as such in 1955. That's when Fortune magazine noticed, hey, there's a lot of stability among the big companies in the United States. They never change. And they never change for a reason. There was a high progressive taxation. Um, so, I mean, we owe the existence of Silicon Valley and that sort of thing to, to tax rate cuts, especially the racers. Also, the other thing about venture firms, it's very difficult to say, look at Shockley Semiconductor, the early history of Intel. It was very difficult to pay talent in salary back then. Because if you paid them nice money in salary, they faced 50, 60, 70% rates. Um, so you had to get an ex exemption written in the code that you could pay them, say, the way Alcoa did in the 1950s, which, in which they saved about $4 million on $5 million of compensation because they had special pet deductions written in there. But if you're a little venture firm or a little firm in Silicon Valley, you don't have the muscle to hire a K Street lobbyist for that. So you can't pay people to leave Westinghouse, to leave General Electric or whatever to come to your firm. So there was. There was an ossification in the American corporate structure. So the Fortune 500 liked it. And you see what happened to the Fortune 500 when we got those tax cuts. <laughs> well, a lot of them bit the dust, you know? Uh, there was an 80% turnover in the Fortune 500 from 1980 to 2000, uh, which we had those serial tax cuts. And that's exactly what the Fortune Now, I have to say, all those people who worked at the Fortune 500 who got laid off, how uh, they did? Well, they all went on to bigger and better things in the diversified, you know, wonderful booms of the 1980s and 1990s. The other group that was opposed to was the labor unions. Labor unions liked a slow growth, actually, because they liked job scarcity. Because if there's job scarcity, um, you really want to join a union because the unions are doling out the jobs. So the unions feared if there were rapid economic growth, there would not be job scarcity, and there would be no incentive to join a union. Uh, and the unions also kind of played along with corporations and got certain uh, exemptions written into the tax code that only unions could negotiate. For example, health care deduction, the most notorious exemption in the code, that employer provided health care insurance is tax deductible. But that's only if you work for a certain company that's a certain size, and uh, the unions would negotiate that. So unions were opposed to slow growth. And then the segregationists in Congress, this is a fascinating, amazing story. Robert Byrd and uh, Albert Gore, in particular, is kind of the worst. Uh, the senator from Tennessee, father of uh, the recent vice president, 
um, they realized that the main people that the unions were shutting up jobs. So the jobs had to be rationed in the 50s. So we have this class of structurally increasing poor, unemployed. Well, they were all the newcomers to the workforce. So the uh, immigrants, uh, hillbillies, as Michael Harrington called them, and then blacks, who were especially those moving from the south to the north, African Americans. Um, and it's here where the African American shift uh, really flipped from uh, Republican to voting Democratic. It's not actually the 30s, it's in the uh, And if you look, Robert Novak did a big survey of this in 1960, and he found that the big issue was the lack of jobs. And so the unions, of course, naturally just deny the African American jobs. Well, if we're going to ration the jobs, we're going to give the blacks the shaft. I mean, somebody's got to take the shaft. So, got to be blacks. Um, so the segregationists in the South like this, right? Hey, we have fellow, we have functional allies in the North. The North is now sullying its hands with de facto segregation because of this slow economy. We better keep this slow economy because if economic growth is ginned up, then the North is going to drop this racism thing because they won't be discriminating on jobs anymore because there'll be so many jobs that it will be impossible to discriminate. So it's in our interest for us to keep the slow growth going so that they have to be racist in the North. All right, and this is very well understood as the tax cuts being discussed in the summer of 1963. In fact, it's right when Kennedy introduces his civil rights bill in the wake of the Birmingham outrages in 1963, in June 1963, that uh, Robert Byrd tells Kennedy, oh yeah, if you introduce civil rights bill, we're just not going to pass your tax cut. And then they held it up, and Albert Gore and the Senate Finance Committee just said, you know, that guy's going to ruin the whole social segregation thing if we have this tax cut. Um, one of the reasons it passed, it finally passed now since September of 1963, um, when the, it was just by happenstance, when the tax cut was put up for uh, open house discussion and then up for a vote for the first time, it was September 16th, Monday morning, 1963, the first time the gavel fell in Congress after the Birmingham church bombing, which killed the four girls, which was the most outrageous incident in the entire history of the civil rights movement. And that was so shocking to the defenders of segregation that they could not mount resistance to the tax cut the very next day on the grounds that we have to deny Kennedy's legacy. So they were so cowed that that's why the tax cut passed. It passed because the civil rights opponents were so cowed. So actually, <laughs> In a, in a weird way, the modern martyr girls did forward the civil rights revolution in that the tax cut passed. Uh, so it finally now, or the reason it didn't pass by Kennedy's lives, so now the Senate Finance Committee was filibustering it de facto. Um, and then once Kennedy died, that became untenable and outraged. And so as soon as it passed both houses of Congress on February 26, 1964, uh, the next act of the, Demo of the Democrats in Congress was to filibuster the civil rights bill. So, um, when that tax cut passed, though, man, economic growth. And uh, we have all of Johnson's tapes when uh, he was uh, talking with uh, his political operatives about it. He says, like, we have these conversations with Richard Daly, the mayor of Chicago. And Daly's saying, like, uh, yeah, no, nobody, there's like no racism here anymore. Because, like, everyone has a job. That's what he's saying. And Johnson said, yeah, that's why we passed the tax cut, to break this, uh, the, fellow traveling of the North with Southern segregation. This is all in Democratic Party history. Okay? This, the Democratic Socialists are the ones who pointed to that 91% tax rate and said, that thing's got to come down if we want to do anything about this 50, not 50 million poor in the United States. It was the Democrats, now we find the Democrats and segregationists too, but it was the other Democrats, the non-segregationist Democrats, who said, you know what? The reason we're saddled with this discrimination is that we don't have a growing economy. If we had a growing economy, African Americans would have jobs, and people would just chill out about segregation, not care about it anymore. Let's do this. How they've forgotten this legacy, I'll never know. Now, the Kennedy plan has been no help, um, because the Kennedy plan has always said, Ed Kennedy, Caroline, all the rest, uh, some of them are skiers, I understand, right? Uh, but, uh, or, uh, George, Gerald Ford was really the only one who was here, up there reminds us, and his uh, great book, Memories of the Ford Administration. But um, uh, the, um, they always say, oh, no, 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 that's a big giveaway to the rich. That has nothing to do, you know, these tax cuts have nothing to do with the little guy. Uh, the Reagan tax cut is an outrage. Uh, George W. Bush is an outrage. Uh, cease and desist letters to Scott Brown 
into Linda McMahon when she ran for Senate. Um, you remember Scott Brown's big offense, he got a big nasty uh, tongue lashing from Carolyn Kennedy, President's own daughter. Uh, and what was his offense? He had played a video of John F. Kennedy saying we should cut taxes for the following reasons. It was, it was like for Peggy. <laughs> and she said, that's, that's an average. Okay. So Larry and I realized, okay, it's time to write this book. And just, you don't want it in your face, how about down your throat? You know, <laughs> because, uh, you know, you don't want to be thrown in the briar patch, you know, it's we're going to put you. Um, how the Democrats have lost this history. So we are hopeful now, well, I don't know if pessimistics are, I do think maybe, well, the Democrats would win the election uh, this year, if they do, and if the Republicans win. Um, it's in the bipartisan spirit of this country uh, to cut the top rate of the income tax. Um, there's no way that uh, capital formation that creates jobs can ever happen when you have effective 60% tax rates in this country, which we do. I mean, the top rate of the income tax is 42.5%. If you're in California, you have 13.3 at least. Um, so that means the capital will hide in tax shelters and municipal bonds and in hedges that don't pay coupons or interest, such as gold um, or treasury bonds. So, you know, you've got to unlock that capital. And that capital, the estimates are it's, in the, it's over $10 trillion that's locked in uh, hideouts. And if you unlock it, they'll just be percolating the economy and create, I don't know, 44 million new jobs, because that's how many new jobs were created from 1983 to 2000. Um, John Kennedy's job rate, uh, rate of growth rate was five times larger than Eisenhower's with the tax cut. Uh, so it's part of the bipartisan history. And one last word about uh, Bill Bradley in the 1980s. Ever since Reagan was a big tax cutter, yeah, sure, a big, uh, you know, 23% tax cut just to start with. So from 70, 70 down to 50. That's Reagan's tax cut in 1981. Kemp Roth took the top rate of the income tax to 50%. 50, right? 7.5 points higher than today. Uh, and then it was after that that Bill Bradley, the Democratic Socialist Senator from New Jersey, said it has to be low. It has to go down. And do you know, back we have all this documents. I talk a lot about this all the time. He was talking Reagan's ear off about this. The biggest goal the most ambitious goal that Jack Kemp and Arthur Laffer and all those guys had is we could get the top rate down to 38%. Because that would represent another kind of 23% tax cut. They had one 23% tax cut from 70 to 50, then they'd get another one from 50 down to 38, or 37.5. Uh, being another like 25% tax cut. That was their, that was, that was their like, in their wildest dream, in their bet, that was actually their, their realistic major goal to get 38%. And Brown said, no, take it down to 28, 24. And he's like, that's where the capital formation is. And what you do is you devalue the exemptions in the code. And he had been reading the Kennedy guys, and particularly Stanley Surrey, who was Kennedy's assistant secretary for tax policy, who coined the term tax expenditures. Bradley had been reading it, we have the evidence of this, saying that no, when you lower the tax rate, that lowers the incentive to find a deduction, to find an exemption, to pay a K Street lobbyist. You devalue exemptions. And if there's anything a populist in this country should want, it would be to devalue the exemptions that the rich and well-connected have to get work done in Washington. So if you take the top rate down to 28%, there's very little incentive for anyone to get an exemption from that rate. You don't need to launch a seek and destroy mission for exemptions if the rate's only 28% down to 50. So let's take that 50 on that principle. That was the principle, it's Democratic Socialist. And Reagan's like, did he just say 28%? He did? Right Bill Bradley. So you'd like that he actually said, right Rossi, right Dan Ross and Kowski. You know, Dan Ross and Kowski, the House of Ways and Means Committee, big liberal, said, yeah, that's a great idea. It actually is the most significant bipartisan achievement in domestic policy, I would say, in the 20th century, yeah, at least since 1913, the Tax Reform Act of 1986. It is amazing that that top rate never became sacred, 28%, because it passed the Senate in 97 to 3. Uh, Ted Kennedy voted for it, Gary Hart, I mean, all these, you know, liberal icons. And Paul Simon, I think, was the only one who voted against it. Uh, two others, I forget who they were. So, I mean, big bipartisan consensus. The Republicans said, of course, we need tax rates for incentives. And the Democrats said, we need to have the top tax rate low so that the rich don't use their connections to opt out of using their capital in the real economy. Democratic, Republican consensus. I actually do blame George H.W. Bush for being so cavalier about it. I mean, he's just like, he dispensed with it immediately. Let's raise it by three points in 1990. And then that just made it go all the way, put a balloon on it. Uh, so in 2016, Larry and I are very confident that if we uh, did what John Kennedy said he was going to do at the Yale commencement address, why don't we get a sound dollar and tax rate cuts? What do we 
did that. Whatever he said, we're just gonna make the dollar sound, you know? It's just like, we're not gonna fool around with these weird monetary policy games, just like a sound dollar, you know? Target a price of gold or something like that. Uh, so that Chris says. And uh, we'll just have tax rate cuts. The tax rate cuts will produce an incredible demand for the dollar, because everyone will want it so they can invest with it, because the rate of return goes way up with tax rate cuts. And it'll be real easy to conduct monetary policy because everyone wants the dollar. You don't have to like give it to them, push it out the door. Uh, and I don't know, produce 5.1% growth for nine years under Kennedy, and uh, you know, 44 million new jobs for 17 years after 1983. Bill Clinton cut the capital gains rate in 1997. Um, so we think uh, this incredible latent prosperity that has been persisting in the nation can actually rise up and reclaim all those 15 million under and underemployed and we can have uh, in America fully prosperous once again. So thank you very much. <laughs> we have time for questions and discussion. The Democrats, particularly the Clintons, have, have continually said that one of the reasons for the prosperity uh, of the 90s yeah. was because they increased yeah, that's a great point. So the Clintons have long said that the one of the reasons, the main reason the prosperity of the 1990s was their tax increase in 1993 when they took top tax rates up to uh, 30, 39%. Yeah, that is the standard argument. It's called Rubenomics. <coughs> we had to take care of the deficit. And this is what prevented the economy. Okay, uh, let's look at uh, some metrics. So from 1983 to 1989, growth was phenomenal, 4.5%. But then there was four years of rough patch. So we had the only recession the whole period, 1990 to 91. So I had 2% growth from 90 through 94. Uh, and then 94 through 2000, you went to the 4.5% growth. So it's second, so 4.5 from 82 to 89, seven years, two from 90 to 94, 4.5 from 94 to 2000. And uh, the interesting thing is the floor of the stock market. The actual, because we always hear about the legendary boom in the stock market, so the secular bottom of the stock market, actually the, the last time it was low, the lowest point ever, uh, secularly, uh, was Election Day 1994. It was the day the Republicans took Congress. Uh, that was actually the inflection. It's also the inflection point, is Clinton's argument, the reputation of the argument. It also was the inflection point that day, Election Day 1994, when the Republicans took Congress, was the inflection point in the interest rate of the 30-year long bond of the Treasury. So that interest rate had been going up, 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 up. You know, Clinton's talking about fiscal solvency. We need to raise taxes because the deficit's too big. Well, as he did that, the Treasury went up, 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 up. It hit a secular <laughs> peak, never seen since, the day the Republicans took Congress. And it just collapsed since then. In fact, the 30 year long bond was eliminated in 2002 for a couple of years. So it's just a straight line, straight down. The stock market straight line on that inflection point. So, I don't think I have to look too far into what was going on a year and a half before, let's say in March of 1993, when Clinton passed this tax increase, and say, that's the reason for the turnaround in the 1990s. No, I think I know what the reason for the turnaround in the 1990s is. It's that once the Republicans took Congress, it became very clear that taxes were going one way, and that was down. And sure enough, Bill Clinton cut taxes in 1997 on the capital gains rate that, you know, uh, which the Republicans have always had love affair with. The only place spending was going was down, and spending went really far down. I mean, there was a 25% decrease in spending, albeit much of it defense spending, but still a 25% decrease in federal spending from 1994 to 2000. And Bill also freed up trade, and he deserves his own credit for that. I mean, big free trader. So, the only thing the markets knew is that once the problem took Congress, tax rates are going down, spending's going down, and we're going to start running surpluses. And once you start running surpluses, that means you have to start cutting tax rates big time. That's really why we had a loss, we've had these lost 16 years in the 2000s, that we didn't have a significant Kennedy-like tax cut, and Bush just didn't count. Uh, that we didn't have a 30% tax cut in 2000, it's crazy. When you're running a $236 million tax uh, surplus, which we were in 2000, and not announcing a major tax cut, what do you want the markets to say except, Oh, you're going to try to be big, government. I mean, if you're running $236 million in surplus and there isn't a bipartisan consensus for a major tax cut, that's just weird. So I think that's a big reason we had to, you know, we've had the, the last, last, last 15 years. Um, another great example would be Coolidge, obviously, with Melvin. But, um, one of the oldest in the Depression area, and one of our candidates, his name I won't mention, his initials are called Trump, talks a lot about. Paris. I mean, just obsessed with China, and Mexico, South Korea, and I'm worried about the impact. We talk about that relative to taxes, yeah. the impact of terrorism. 
Yeah, tariffs. Um, tariffs are really weird. You know, Donald Trump is talking a lot about tariffs, and uh, you know, uh, you know, Arthur Lamb's a big kind of supporter of Donald Trump, and uh, Larry's worried about it. Uh, Donald Lamb thinks that he'll drop it completely. Uh, let's just remember too that the Mitt Romney, uh, when he ran president in 2012, he said the first thing he would do as president um, was uh, declare China a currency manipulator, which was effectively a tariff. Uh, and that's actually the first thing George W. Bush did as president, is he, he imposed all these steel quotas, steel tariffs. Um, yeah, actually, that's the history of the Republican Party. The Republican Party and its predecessor, the Whig Party, uh, that was the only, that was the major system of taxation in the United States, tariffs. Uh, so it's in the Republican blood. Uh, there have always been tariff guys. The thing about the tariffs is um, that's, that's the part of the tax system that is completely owned by the lobbyists, because tariffs are actually lists of specific goods that can't come in. States unless they're done with these duties. And every one of those specific goods represents a competitor in the United States. And it's specifically the competitor who hires a lobbyist that gets the line written into the code. So there's nothing, there's no intermediary institution like the general income tax. The whole thing is a list of exemptions and special preferences. There's no, nothing moderating that at all. So tariffs are really worrisome. On, the, on that point, because number one, their benefits accrue exclusively to uh, the money class, and number two, they're horrible economics. Now, as Kennedy knew, Kennedy's a huge tariff guy. Uh, economic growth solves all those problems. I mean, you have a sound dollar and low tax rates, uh, you're not going to have a real trade problem. I mean, Reagan looked at the trade problem, you know, right in the 80s. But the thing is, there, the dollar appreciated massively. Dollar's not, you know, dollar's not supposed to collapse, but also not supposed to skyrocket. It's supposed to be one of the attributes of the gold standard is fixed exchange rates. So this is supposed to be major currency should be fixed to each other because there shouldn't be speculation currency. If there's speculation currency, you're just taking this dead weight loss to the real economy. So, uh, yeah, I mean, we think that if there's really no growth, you shrink spending, cut tax rates, have sound dollar, uh, low spending, sparse regulation, uh, there's going to be so much capital investment in the United States that uh, you're just going to get rid of those tariffs. I'll tell you, I'll tell you, uh, uh, I've been talking to uh, uh, some, you know, policymakers about this, and um, you know, we have very high labor costs right now because of the tax cliffs of Obamacare and so forth. I mean, you basically have to give a person who's making thirty thousand dollars, seventy thousand dollars, for them to make one dollar because they lose so many preferences. They lose their earned income tax credit, they lose their Section Eight housing, they lose their Obamacare subsidies. You have to more than double their salary for them to make one dollar. Do you realize what that does to labor costs in the United States? You can't hire people. Okay, so that's labor costs have gone way up. Capital costs have gone way up. Dollars unstable, we've increased the capital gains rate. So our labor costs have gone way up, our capital costs have gone way up, and we're wondering why we're not competitive internationally. We're blaming the Chinese and the Mexicans. Yeah. Have you done anything related to what you're saying with uh, Kennedy's effort to replace Federal Reserve notes with the United States notes by executive order in '63. Yeah, uh, Kennedy. Um, Kennedy was a strong dollar guy. Um, it, let, let me talk about some of his monetary policy stuff. Uh, he brought in Douglas Dillon as Treasury Secretary uh, for that reason. This is a Republican. Eisenhower's Under Secretary of State for Monetary Affairs. Um, I, let me talk about one other thing, if you don't mind. Kennedy played games initially. He set up this thing called the London Gold Pool. 1961, where the governments were trying to fix the private price of gold because uh, the United States was guaranteeing to foreigners gold at $35 an ounce. So, if ever in the private markets gold went up above $35 an ounce, there would be this mad rush to the United States for gold redemptions at $35, and then they could sell privately at a higher price. Mm -hmm. So, instead of simply cutting tax rates and having a sound dollar, which would end that completely because the rates of return and real investments would go way up. Kennedy fooled around for a year and a half. And he, you know, had a London gold pool. He, we, he got to drop all that stuff once he cut tax rates. Once he made the decision to cut tax rates, the investment went into the real economy. Okay, so Federal Reserve rates in the United States does. I'm trying to remember exactly what uh, his, his plan was. There, could you remind me what his exact, uh, what, uh, how, the, how the United States goes were to differ from the Federal Reserve rates? Well, he signed an executive order, I don't remember the number, Sometime about July of '63, authorizing the issuance of two or three billion in the United States. Okay. Yeah, I'm trying to remember what the legal tender implications of that uh, were. Um, so uh, I'd have to research that. Yeah. I don't understand any of this stuff, but is there a chance in hell that we will ever get a flat rate? And if so, what would it be? 
Yeah, great and, question. And also maybe a three way <laughs> Yeah, okay, great. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Yeah. So what's the chance we ever get a flat flat rate tax and three page tax return? And I'll say a three page income tax code instead of the you know fifty thousand page number we have today. So uh, okay, can we ever? Is that hopeless? Well hold it. In 1986, after the Tax Reform Act of 1986, so in 1987-89, there were two tax rates in this country, 28 and 15. That was it. Yeah. That's pretty close to a flat tax. That's, you know, that's almost functionally a flat tax. So we have it right there, and was it bipartisan? The greatest bipartisan consensus, more than any of that stuff in the Great Society, anything, any, you have to go back to literally the creation of the income tax, the Federal Reserve, which oddly was bipartisan, 1913. There was never a consensus. <coughs> so I would assume it can be done because it was done in recent memory fantastically. That's again, I, I do impugn, I've written about this recently in Forbes, I do impugn President H.W. Bush a lot actually for this because he was very cavalier in not establishing the sacramental quality of that 28% rate. Uh, as soon as the budget deficit came in a little higher, he said, well, let's just pump up the top tax rate. Well, hold it. Yeah. There was just an incredible bipartisan consensus. And if you let that 28% rate cement a little bit, let's say he doesn't budge that rate in 1990. It sticks around for a few years. You know, do you think there's capital flight in the United States? Do you think there's a better recovery? In yeah, there is. Well, let's say we have that for five, ten years. And then we have these booms. You might take on sacramental qualities. And then there it is, there's your flat tax. Okay, 15, 28, whatever, that's pretty flat. Flattest it's ever been, actually, in American history. So, yes, it's our resources of our history are right there. Now think about it for your great tax cut. Well, if you have a low top rate in particular, and the top rate's the important one, the incentive for exemptions are very low. I mean, an exemption from a 91% rate means you keep 91 more cents out of a dollar. 91 versus, you keep 100 instead of keeping nine. <coughs> The exemption is worth 11-fold. <coughs> the exemption is worth 1,100%. If you devalue the 28%, you already keep 72 cents. If you get an exemption, you keep 28. The incentive isn't there <coughs> to really pay the big money. Famous, uh, let me get one more drink. Famous remark that Kennedy liked was from his SEC chair, William Carey. <coughs> William Carey. Was professor of law at Northwestern, and Kennedy named him to his father's own post as the chairman of the Security Exchange Commission in 1961. William Carey said, back in the 50s, he said, uh, um, we, we don't advise our clients <coughs> uh, to litigate their tax cases. We advise them to get the statute changed. <laughs> um, so that's what happens when you have very high tax rates. So if you have low tax rates, we advise our clients just to deploy their capital and submit it to taxation because tax rates are low. But if tax rates are high, we advise our clients to, you know, call their history lawyers. Why can't we get a consensus in Congress <coughs> to lower the corporate rate to bring this money back to the United yeah. States? That's a good question. Larry talked about this all the time. I think that would be a slide about. Hmm? Why can't we lower the corporate tax rate? Uh, 35%. I think it seems like it's a slam dunk. Yeah, I'm afraid I, you know, we, 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 you know, the corporate tax rate recently has been producing less than 1% of GDP revenues. It's almost, it's, almost, it's a really great example of the curve. Uh, it's almost, like tariffs. Tariffs are now almost all prohibitive, so they're not productive of revenue. If you lowered the tariff rate in virtually every case right now, sugar, whatever, you would get more revenue from the tariff if you lowered it. And it's the same thing with corporate rate, because the corporate tax revenue has really dried up at a high rate of 35%. I'm afraid we know what the answer is. Um, we know that the big defenders of it are in the Fortune 500. And General Electric has been a defender of it um, because, you know, they're not paying it. <laughs> Obviously, they're not paying it because of these pet exemptions. So if you have a high rate, you increase the value of these exemptions. Um, and that's why the tax code is 50,000 pages long. So right, you can seem to be a slam dunk, except there's a small constituency that's very powerful because the stuff done. That's why you need bipartisan consensus. That's why I think it would be really nice and public spirited for the Democrats to learn their real democratic socialist history and to real to use those resources to overcome their phobias of cutting tax rates on the highest earners. Because it's becoming a psychological obstruction in the democratic psyche. Um, 
that they can't, they fetishize the top right of the income tax. If they could overcome that, they could realize how they could take care of the poverty problem in the United States. Yeah. Along those lines, uh, there's the capital gains we're talking about. Oh, sure. Yeah, the capital gains, you bet. It's capital gains worth talking about. So I guess what's the right now? I don't even know, 23 or 28? Top right capital gains. You remember uh, the president, Barack Obama, the first president, he conceded the point. He said, oh no, I know. He said this very famously, he repeated it. His, has not disavowed it to this day. I know that raising the rate will bring in less revenue. I understand that. I want to raise the rate and have it bring in less revenue because that, um, that seems fair. So he said, and he's never backed down from that point. And he went ahead and raised the rate. So, uh, of course it should be discussed because obviously if you raise the rate and bring in less revenue, you have depressed activity in capital creation. And coincident with that, of course, is lack of job creation. So it would seem to be another slam dunk here, but this is where I would appeal to the Democrats. I and mean, we always hear about the Republicans have these mental problems and they have these phobias and these techies. I think, I think the Democrats have to, have, to, have to start learning their own history and learning their, um, the traditions of their party. I mean, John, John F. Kennedy you know, wrote Profiles of Courage with Ted Sorensen. And uh, he dated, uh, right before he proposed to Jackie, he dated a woman named Margaret Coit who had just uh, won the Pulitzer Prize in biography for her biography of John C. Calhoun in 1951. And Calhoun was the founder of the Democratic Party. His principle was, he was a big proponent of terror, we should, we should have low, flat tax rates and a stable dollar because those things will be most beneficial to the working and lower classes. High tax rates and unstable dollar are much more easily dealt with by the well-heeled and the privileged and the well-connected. It's very difficult, differentially, for the lower classes to deal with that. And this, is, this was the traditional party for 160 years, through the 1980s. Um, and these people were all opposed to high tax rates and capital gains. No, we need capital formation. The, the resources of the rich are supposed to be at the services of the country. And that means tax rates have got to be low. So no, I think, it's, I think the Democrats really have to come to terms with their own history and their own, their own intellectual development. Uh, I think I read recently that one of the candidates wants to go back to the gold standard. Mm -hmm. And if that's true that I did read that, what's the implications of it? Yep. And uh, yep, I think there are sure. parts of that I can't think of what they are. Right, okay, so yeah, the question is, uh, you heard that one of the candidates has said, said we should go back to the gold standard. What are the implications of that? That candidate surely was Ted Cruz. Uh, he said at first at the Boulder debate, he said so subsequently, and I and several friends uh, started a political action committee a couple months ago on that basis. We're big gold standard people, uh, and that's been doing a lot of stuff. So we, uh, I'm a, a long time advocate of the gold standard myself. Uh, yeah, it'd be great. So all the gold standard is, is that the United States says that it will freely um, redeem its currency at a set price of gold, uh, which the United States has done. Uh, all of its history, basically, until 1971. Um, and uh, what we've learned throughout uh, recent history, especially in the 1980s, is when you cut tax rates big time, well, the demand for the dollar is so great. I mean, everybody wants their hands on the dollar. Why? Because you can make a lot of money and do great things. You can really do great, great things in the economy if you can get your, get some hand, your hands on some dollars. So. Nobody's going to want gold or any of those weird hedges against the dollar. They're going to want dollars. <coughs> so if you cut tax rates, this again an incredible demand for the dollar. You'll see the price of gold go down. I would say about $500 an ounce today. <coughs> I would say. So sorry. And then once the price of gold falls, it stays stable while the economy is roaring. All you have to do is just say, you know what, from now on, we're going to buy and sell gold freely anytime anyone wants it. Anytime when somebody says, I have $500, give me an ounce of gold, we'll do it. Now, this is not even need Fort Knox. Sell Fort Knox, get rid of it. It was, it was tanked illegally anyway in 1933. That terms gold confiscation. But you just go to the market and buy the gold. But nobody does that. When the United States resumed the gold standard in 1879, we're going to now, hey, you get $20 anytime. You get an ounce of gold anytime you give us $20. They opened the window and nobody showed up because the economy was booming so much. Nobody wanted their gold. Now I'm going to buy stocks and start a business. You know, I'm going to use my money for real purposes. 
And if we had done that in the 1980s, <coughs> so as soon as Reagan cut taxes, the price of gold plummeted, gone up 23-fold, gone up in the 1970s. Went from 35 to $840 an ounce. And then went collapsed to 350 and stayed there for 18 years. What if at any moment in the 1980s or 1990s, the United States had said, we, we guarantee the dollar $350 an ounce? There wouldn't have been an ounce of I'll tell you that much. Um, and we probably would have just continued on this path throughout the 2000s. So that was a huge missed opportunity in the 80s and the 90s. So we should, yeah, we should. Next time we cut tax rates, we've got to go back to the gold standard right after. Foreign countries that subscribe to your tax policies? Yeah, there's a lot of foreign. It's funny, the foreign influence it often comes in that way. That's how it happened in 1962. So, Reg, I mean, Kennedy had these uh, Keynesian advisors. On his council of economic advisors, they were saying, "Let's not have taxes." Well, the Treasury Secretary was saying something different, and then finally, the Treasury Secretary just started shoving in his face all these European reports. So the Swiss, Basel, Switzerland, back in the international settlements, the International Monetary Fund, all these other places, little bit Earhart in Germany. They said, "You got to, you got to stabilize the dollar and cut taxes." Uh, so that that happened. That's you know, that's that's history. Um, now today, of course, uh, foreign governments are foreign governments. Like China, for example, uh, we're in the supply side business, I am. Uh, we've been besieged by requests for translation. The Chinese want to translate every single thing we've ever written. Mm -hmm. The last few months, I've heard that China has said, you know, we're starting to sink. And every time we start to sink, we want to go back to the best examples in the recent past of economic recovery. And so, of course, they pick Reagan. They're picking Reagan right now. Um, and they picked Reagan in the 1990s when they first decided to fix the yuan, the RMB to the dollar. The people they brought in, the, the guy they brought in was Robert Mundell, who was the guy with the IMF member of Kennedy, who then mentored Arthur Laffer, who became the greatest economist of the 20th century. Most economists believe that, by the way. Uh, the founders of Placid Economics. Uh, they brought him in, and he said, well, yeah, you should fix your currency to the dollar. Uh, you should have a stable exchange rate, a civil accord with the gold standard, you should cut tax rates and all that stuff. So yeah, there's a lot of foreign influence. All the Eastern European countries have flat tax rates, and they all, they all solicit the supply side of advice in the early 1990s. Brian, any closing thoughts for us? Uh, I'm going to harp on the Democrats again. I know we have some work to do on the Republicans and trade barriers and all that stuff, and I do hope that the Republicans, if they win, do cut tax rates and stabilize the dollar. But I want to uh, prevail upon the Democrats, too, that that is even more in their tradition. Thank you.